Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I hope that all the tech is going to align in our favor tonight, as I am always hoping when we start our webinars. If you could just give me a quick hello in the chat box to say that you can hear me, you can see me, everything is looking good. That will be very, very helpful. All right, and I'm going to get everything set up on my end. I can do that ahead of time, but then it always resets everything. So let me just look. Hi, great. I'm seeing people's highs come through. They can hear me, see me. Awesome. Hi, Timothy, Helen. Uh, let's see who else is it? Laura, Noel, Valerie, of course, is here. Um, it's great to see everyone. I really, really appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again um, so that you can see my slides and we'll make sure that that is working and then we will get to jump into our content. There we go. Okay, so you should be able to see that screen. Okay, hopefully. Um, welcome, welcome to Parent Chat. Um, we are talking tonight about why your child isn't talking. Um, I'm Sherry Gazit, otherwise known as Coach Sherry, and I'm the founder of TeenWise. I'm passionate about supporting parents and kids of all ages, really. And if you have a younger child, I know I'm from TeenWise, but you're still in the right place because a lot of the stuff we learn in the teen world, it trickles down into the younger ages and you can just start sooner. Um, so you're in the right place no matter what age your child is. If you've attended parent chats in the past, you probably know that I'm usually here as the facilitator. So I'm excited tonight that I get to be here as the presenter. And I'm super glad you're here because tonight what we're gonna be learning is really going to offer you a way to look at conversations that you're having with your kids and it will fundamentally change your relationship with your child. Now I'm bringing to you a wealth of knowledge from like 30 years of working in um, the psychological profession. And yes, 30 years, I feel so old when I can say that, but I need to be proud about that, right? And I have about 24 years of parenting experience that I'm bringing to you. My kids are currently 19, 22, and 24. So we made it, yay, almost through the teen years. We've got one more year officially left, but I'm super excited to be able to bring information to you from, from all of those experiences. And so my job really is to bring those experiences and that the stuff I've learned over the years to you in a way that's helpful to you as a parent. Because I don't wanna just talk at you. I don't want this information to be you know, something you learn and you move on. I want to bring it to you in a way that is helpful so that you can take action steps and make a change in your relationship with your child. Now, for those of you who obviously have attended the parent chats and know me as a facilitator, I also work really hard to help bring mental health resources to the community and particularly proud to bring it to you through parent chat. So I'm on this parenting journey with you now. Consider me in your back pocket as a tool in your toolbox. And if you need me, I will be here for you. Okay, so I want to invite you tonight, to just take a deep breath and jump into this parent chat with both feet. So I want you to think of this as if we're like hanging out in someone's living room, we're all on the couch, having fun, having a glass of tea or a glass of wine, whatever your preference is, and we're just here to support each other. So along those lines, I encourage you to comment in the chat box. That's kind of the way we're gonna have a conversation, right? Um, tonight. So as things come up for you, it can be something that you're like, hmm, I hadn't really thought of that. Throw that in the chat box. If you're um, just wanting to comment on a resource or something like that, or something you're going through, you can put that in the chat box too. Because here's the thing. This isn't just about you sitting back learning. We're learning from each other. So there might be something that stands out for you that you're like, oh, wait, this is a nugget that I'm going to use later. If you throw it in the chat box, then another parent might say, oh, yeah, I totally didn't catch that. Or, yeah, you're right. That would be a good piece of information. So we would love to invite you to do that. So let's warm up the chat box, okay? I want to ask you first why you're here tonight, because I know that your time is super valuable, and this time of year is really busy. So what brought you here tonight? You can share that in the chat box. You can tell me about 
maybe something that you're going through in your family in particular, or just something that you're hoping to learn or something that you're hoping to get out of this. All right, and if you have any questions, as always, you can drop those into the Q&A box. If you kind of look down near the bottom of the screen for most of you, it has a little speech bubble that says Q&A. You can put your questions in there. Don't worry about the timing. If a question pops into your head, throw it into the Q&A box because it gives it to me in this nice little package so I can find all of those questions. They won't get lost in the chat box. The chat box can get busy sometimes, so I don't want to miss your questions because they are important. Your questions are why I'm here, all right? If you feel like it's not relevant, ask it anyway, and I will answer it when I have time. Okay, let's get started. Okay, first of all, let's see what you all have to say. Um, you have a tween, teens are challenging. Yes, I think we can all agree teens are challenging, so challenging. Um, my teens are constantly on devices, yes. Teens and college age kids, you've got my oldest child talk to me a lot. I would like my younger ones to ask for help when they need it and feel safe asking for resources. I want to improve my relationship with my almost teen. Uh, let's see, I have a teen that's going through some difficult things. I want to be able to support her and have conversations. That's a really, really great reason to be here. Very relevant. Seems the daughter seems distant. Yes. Okay. Still learning how to communicate. Absolutely. Okay, so you all are in the right place. You all are saying exactly what, what I expected to hear. And so we're right on, we're spot on here. Okay, I want to tell you why we're doing this topic. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the topic for this parent chat was kind of based on hundreds of conversations I've had with parents and with teens. And parents often, they'll ask me, what's the secret to getting my kid to talk to me again? or to just open up. And unlike a lot of books and courses or whatever that you might read or you know watch, I'm not gonna tell you that or claim that something I'm gonna tell you tonight is gonna change things overnight for you. It takes work to make changes, right? But I am gonna tell you the first step in making those changes or maintaining the communication that you currently have with your team. And that is you know, to break the silence, you have to rebuild or bolster the trust in the relationship that you have with your team. So it really boils down to trust. Are we good on, on tech? It looks like there's some stuff kind of moving back and forth. Are you guys seeing me? Somebody can let me know. That's good, okay. I need to restart, hold on. My slides disappeared. Um, okay, let me see here. One sec. I knew something was happening. I wasn't quite sure what it was. All right. Can you see that again? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Tatiana. I appreciate it. Okay. As I said at the beginning, you never know with tech what it's going to do. Okay. So we're back. All right. I want to start with the five reasons that teens clam up. And this is based on not just me saying this is why teens don't talk. It's based on a lot, a lot of conversations I've had with teens specifically. And these these things kept coming up and I'm giving you five tonight. There's there's more than this, but I'm giving you the top five, okay? And I've heard these over and over in some form or fashion. And I'm bringing this to you because I want you to be aware of these so that you can stop and reflect on your own conversations. So you can say, hmm, that is something that I do. Or nope, I'm doing that one good. And none of these are meant for you to beat yourself up, saying I'm not doing this right or whatever. It's all about awareness because we as parents are constantly learning, right? Okay, so number one, too much judgment. We are all guilty of this on some level because we as humans are programmed to judge, right? Our brains are looking for patterns. They're looking for things that are right, things that are wrong. And so our teens though, are kind of like scrutinized on a daily basis, not just from us as parents, but from society, from teachers, from school, um, when they go out to the mall, um, they're constantly being judged. So let's think for a moment, what teens are being judged about. So share that in the chat box so we can all kind of gather an awareness of what our teens are being judged for. And I'll give you a couple of ideas. One is clothes, what they're wearing, what the trends are, maybe friends, maybe grades. 
but there's some other things that we as parents or society judge teens about. What do they feel judged about? Their achievements, that's a good one for sure. Pronouns, oh, thank you, Molly, that's a big one. Yes, pronouns these days, and they're judging each other, right? It doesn't just come from us, but also if they choose a pronoun, sometimes society is judgmental about that. Attractiveness, absolutely. Friendships, that's a good one. Time on devices, yes, I hear that a lot from teens, that they're so tired of the adults in their lives. I'm talking about that. Success on assignments and tests and learning. Absolutely, these are all really good ones, yeah. And start noticing this as you're going through your day-to-day -day life, what your teen is getting judged on. And you might even start a conversation with them. Now, I'm just curious, I was in this parent chat and they were talking about teens being judged. What do you feel like teens are being judged about? Great way to start a conversation, okay. Okay, so you're gonna judge. There's no way to just stop judging because you're human. So what you do is you think about those judgments internally as your kids are doing things, saying things, um, achieving, not achieving. So you think about those, but you kind of keep the poker face. And when you're conversing with your children, you don't talk about those judgments. You can take those judgments to the side, work them out, process them. Why am I judging so much on this particular thing? A lot of it goes back to your own childhood stuff where societal pressures for parents, right? So let me give you an example on this one. If your teen comes and says, hey mom, hey dad, I failed my test. So first of all, that's great if they will come and tell you that because that means that there's an openness there. Now, if you in that moment start talking about, yeah, that's because you were on your video game too much or I told you to study more or you should have done more, you should have asked for more help. What you're doing in that moment is judging. And so next time they fail a test or they don't get the grade they wanted, they're probably not gonna come and talk to you. And that starts the claiming up. Is this kind of resonating for anybody as we can stop and reflect? Okay, the second thing. Parents, we're all guilty of this. Sometimes we blow it out of proportion. Um, parents, we can make a big deal out of something that's really not that big of a deal. Um, you can act like it's the end of the world, like it's a huge catastrophe. And what you're doing when you do that is you're revving up your own kids worry and their own self doubt and their anxiety. So if they fail a test, if someone was mean to them, um, got in trouble at school, um, sometimes it can even be a positive thing. Like they get an award and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so awesome. Um, and they don't want that sometimes either, so, all right. Um, but when they're coming to tell us something, what is it that they want from us? They don't want all of this judgment. They don't want you blowing it out of proportion. They're looking for someone to comfort them and to maybe guide them depending on the situation. But what they don't want is for you as a parent to get emotional, to make it bigger than it is, right? So think about the next time that they share a struggle with you or something that's going on, whether it's girl drama, getting in trouble at school, they're looking to you for that love and compassion and they want to feel better. So are you making them feel better or are you making them feel worse? Grace, I appreciate that. Um, you're seeing me, sorry. Okay, here's the next one. The hostile takeover is what I like to refer to it as. This is when your child comes to you, confides in you, opens up, tells you something that's going on and you take it over. You go into total fix-it mode that, don't worry, honey, I'm going to make this better. And you're going to fix it for them, whether they like it or not. We see this a lot with academics. If your child fails or they're accused of cheating or um, they forgot an assignment where the parents will step in. There is a time and place for that. But for the most part, we want our kids, when they come to us, to be the one who is still has ownership over that issue. Now, it can feel as a parent, I'm doing something good. I'm helping my kid. But if you look at this in the long term of things, what you're doing is you are telling your kid, I'm going to fix it because you are not capable of fixing it. You are unable to do it. So you're disempowering them instead of empowering them. And every opportunity, I think we all can agree, you want to empower your kids, right? 
So we have to stop ourselves from jumping into that fix it mode, which happens even more when they're younger, right? But even at a younger age, the more you can step back and say, okay, thank you for coming and telling me this. Let's work on this together. What are the next steps? And then you're empowering them and bringing them in, right? They really want to show that they're independent. So we have to give them the opportunities. Has anybody been the fix it mode? Been in the fix it mode? I know I've been there. I know most of the parents I talked to have been there. We have to be really conscious of this thing. Okay, here's a big one. There's a lot of parents don't think about. And this actually is a very big deal to teens that I talk to. This is when you as a parent are inconsistent. It's when one day you're the loving, nice, calm parents, and the next day you're mean and yelling and just horribly aggressive. And research shows that if you come into a room, if you're a person that is kind of like, you know, hot one day, cold the next day, you actually make the, the blood pressure of the person in the room you're entering go up because they don't know what to expect. So your kids need to know that 90% of the time or more that they're gonna get the same parent, the parent who's willing to listen and to comfort and to guide versus lecture and judge and take over things hostily, if you will. Now, everyone's human. You will have your off days. This doesn't, when I'm saying you're inconsistent, I don't mean that 100% of the time you have to be that calm, amazing parent but you do need to work on most of the time that you are going to be the same parent. Okay. And we're striving, of course, for a loving and compassionate conversation. Okay, this is the last one I'm gonna talk about tonight. Number five, last but not least, this is almost every teen I talk to. They really don't want lectures. They don't want lectures from their parents. <laughs> so there was this one teen I was talking to and I was talking to her about this, how her parents were supporting her. And she said that her parents had three primary lectures that they had. So when they would start talking, she basically knew what lecture was coming. Now she would be respectful and act like she was listening, but she really wasn't. And so what happened in that, that situation and for many teens is she just stopped going to her parents to tell her things because she knew she was gonna get a lecture instead of conversation or guidance and support. So think of it like this. You're going to minimize lectures and maximize conversations, okay? Minimize lectures and maximize conversations. If you're able to type, I would love for you to just type this in the chat box so we can solidify this in our neural networks. We want to minimize lectures and maximize conversations. Okay, so we've talked about why teens clam up. These are some of the basic reasons, right? Now that we've talked about that, we want to talk about how to get them to either open up again or to maintain the communication if you do have good communication with your teens. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, it all starts with trust. Okay, so let's dive into trust and what I mean by this. We're going to look at something I call the conversation dashboard. Like a car, you can either be in idle, you can be coasting, or you can rev it up. Which do you think that we're gonna work on as parents, as far as having conversations with our team? And when I say rev it up, it's in a good way. I'll give you a hint. So just in the chat box, put rev it up, okay? And let's see, question here, by conversations, do you mean ask questions? Um, that is one way to have a conversation, absolutely. A conversation, and thank you for this question, a conversation is a back and forth, right? It's not a monologue, it's not a lecture. So it's you talking, them talking. But I will say in a conversation with your teen, when they come to you, the first thing you wanna do is listen. And even in the first moment, if they're kind of like letting it all out, don't even ask questions because you're interrupting them. So just let them, let them go and let them talk freely, and then you can get to the conversation part. So this whole idea of a monologue, um, it's okay from their side, not from your side, because we're trying to connect, right? We're trying to give them their space. Okay, yeah, don't interrupt like that. Okay, so, um, and just like 
you know, when you're in a ride, you need to put your seatbelt on because as somebody mentioned at the beginning, it can be a bumpy ride. Okay, so here's a really good way to visualize conversations, what we're working towards. This is the conversation dashboard slash arc. As you can see here, there's various levels and we're gonna add on to this as we go. This is the basic. Uh, we have on the left side, there's low trust and the middle conditional trust. And then we have the high trust. We obviously wanna to go towards high trust. We want to have relationships in our lives where the trust is very high. And we want to have trust with our teens because we want them to feel safe. We want them to have a safe space in us, in our relationship. So we wanna to work to move from low to high trust. When our kids are entering middle school, there's a big shift in this because your relationship with your teen changes just because they are changing so much. They're not a two-year-old anymore, right? So um, from middle school and then middle to high school, high school to college and beyond, your relationship will be transitioning. And so as it transitions, this trust kind of gets changed around really from both sides, if you think about it. When our kids hit middle school, we began to really get nervous about safety with all the things going on in the world. So the trust from us to them kind of gets thrown over to this low trust because of all the things we hear, right? And for them, it gets kind of thrown down to low trust. So we've got kind of some work we have to do to get it built back up. Okay, the next thing here you'll see in the black section is I to we. So a lot of times what it feels like in a household with tweens and teens is it's us against them, parents against teens and teens against parents. And what we have to work towards is creating kind of the feeling of being on a team together. We're collaborating, we're working together. We have some shared goals. And so if you think of it like that, we're in this together, it really helps to build the, those conversations, right? And instead of like thinking about chores, I want you to go do the dishes. We can say, yeah, we need to get the kitchen cleaned. And so then you start to talk about whose responsibility is what and all of that stuff. Or yeah, we really need to be careful about taking care of the dog because we all love Sparky and we need to make sure Sparky is healthy and gets fed and all of that stuff. Again, instead of I, I, I expect you, you, you to do this. It's again, the we collaborative. That's what we wanna to get to. And when you move from I to we, it's going from low trust to high trust, right? Let's see, it would be nice if they initiated the conversation. It feels like I have to inquire. Yes, this is true. However, I will say it is our job to stay connected to our teens, not vice versa, okay? And if we think about how they're wired, they're not wired to connect to us at that age, they are wired to push us away. So we can't give up, we have to continue to connect with them. But I wish it was like that, right? Okay, now here's another thing you'll notice on the very bottom, we've added listening. Listening is key uh, with our kids. And when you listen more, when you're an active listener, um, then you're moving from low trust, moving that needle over to high trust. And so these all build on itself, right? So if we listen more, we create a feeling of we or a team collaborative conversations and such, then that trust meter keeps building up. Okay, so here's where it gets interesting. A lot of people are operating over here in the low trust area. And when you're over here, what your teen is feeling is that they're not quite sure they can kind of push the boundaries um, or ask questions about things, give their own opinions and such. So it means that your conversations are very transactional, okay? They're mostly falling into the tell and the ask pattern. So your teen says something um, simple like ask a question or you ask them to do something and it's like, one or two words, right? I've heard that from so many parents, like, fine, I don't know, okay, good. Like, there's not a conversation that would be in this area. Um, so I'll give you an example on this one. Let's say you tell them they have a curfew at 1030 and they say, okay, maybe can I stay up till 11? You say, no, that's the end of the conversation. Now, some of you may be like, I wish it was like that. I wish it was so simple. I wish they would just agree with me. 
But the problem is, is that showing that it's transactional, they don't feel like they have the space to push back. And again, it feels good if they don't push back, but it means that they're not, they're not over to these other, um, the higher levels of trust. And it doesn't mean they push back and they're disrespectful. Those are not the same thing. It means that they're pushing back to see how you're going to respond. And then you respond in a purposeful and a measured and calm way that increases the trust. So even if you are creating and setting boundaries and saying no to your kids, you can still be creating a higher level of trust. Okay, now we're gonna move the needle a little bit more. This is where a lot of people will sit once they start becoming aware and want to change conversations with their teen. This is right in the middle. The teens are kind of like not exactly trusting that the, that the trust is there to stay and they're pushing boundaries a little bit, but they don't, they're not still feeling freely to be who they are with you. So this is considered a positional level of conversation. So your teen does start to feel comfortable advocating for themselves, and they might begin to ask questions or inquire about your stance or beliefs. And because if they know what your beliefs are, then they can push back and influence you, right? And um, think about like, if you know the reasoning behind something, then you can start to push on that and, and poke holes there. So again, with the curfew example, if they say something like, I'd like to stay out later, you say no, and then they follow up with, well, why won't you let me stay out later? Um, they are wanting to know your values. So while you can see that as an annoyance and, you know, in olden days, you'd say, because I said so, um, you actually have an opportunity to explain to them because of safety, because of, you know, you have something tomorrow, whatever the reason is. Now, and as I said, this is still like trust isn't completely solidified, but it's going in the right direction. And a lot of times you can get to this level and get stuck where you can't quite move that needle over to the next area, the high trust, um, but it's your job to stay steady because this needle can move kind of back and forth. If you think about a speedometer, just, I don't even think there's speedometers anymore, but if you had a speedometer that's kind of going back and forth like this, um, it's gonna waver sometimes and go back. So you have to kind of work to keep it going in the right direction. Okay, so here we go. We have got our needle moved all the way over to the right. This is the ultimate goal. This is about the, the I to we, this is about listening to understand, the trust is high, life is wonderful, right? We've got the level three conversations and everyone can share and discover. Now think of those two words. I mean, they just sound great, share and discover. So wouldn't it be amazing if you were supporting your teen in a way that allows them to share and discover their world with you in a pivotal, influential support role? So share and discovering together. So you're co-creators of their world. So you're part of it, you're influencing, you're talking to them about things, allowing them to tell you about their values and their positions on things and how they're thinking about life. So it's a safe space to disagree. It's a safe space to make mistakes because you're sharing and discovering in this together. I think we all can agree parenting is a lot about discovering for sure, right? Now this level is very vulnerable, okay? As a parent, it's, it's a balance of giving them the freedom to be their own person, but also making sure you're putting the guardrails in place because you can trust, but that doesn't mean you don't have rules, you don't have boundaries, you don't have consequences. This trust is like a deep level trust of, I'm trusting that you're there for me. I'm trusting you're gonna support me and love me and care for me. And, um, and just be there versus um, controlling them. It's a really big difference. Is this resonating with anybody? I hope this is um, giving you a really good visual and kind of different areas we can work on to get to this higher level of trust. Okay, so one more piece that is important to know is how the brain fits into all of this. So trust means safety, right? So if we're thinking about the brain, we've got kind of the animal part of the brain is the fight or flight too. Um, so if someone feels like they're in the fight or flight mode, where do you think trust is? All the way to the left. 
So if your child doesn't feel that there's trust, there's this low level of fight or flight that's going on. Now, as that trust diminishes more and more and they feel like they don't have a safe space, um, the fight or flight gets more and more and the anxiety gets revved up. And so the logical part of the brain goes offline, emotional kicks in. And here's the thing that happens. When they don't feel safe, there's the cortisol that kicks in, which is a stress hormone. And it means they are not in a, a, a space, a mental space to accept input or to connect. When you're stressed out, you're not connecting with people or things or whatever, you're not connecting. And the reason is there's a chemical called oxytocin, which is a bonding chemical. So if your stress level is up, your oxytocin level is down. And it means that they're not going to want to emotionally connect with you, but they're also not open to your ideas and your influence. So we really have to work on this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how, okay? Um, let's see, Ashley, I see you have a question. Can you put that in Q&A? Because I want to make sure I do, it doesn't get lost. I'm not going to answer that right now, but I will get back to that, okay? I promise. Okay, remember, questions let's put in the Q&A so I don't lose them. I want to make sure. Okay, so transition. Um, right now, your relationship with your team is in transition. And so there's going to be a lot of things going on, a lot of changes in them, a lot of changes in the way that you're connecting. Um, and this is really, it's not a one-sided metamorphosis because you're seeing them differently. They're seeing you differently. You're communicating differently. There's a lot of change. So your communication style has to change. Now, for those of you with younger kids, it has to change if you're thinking of a like a three-year-old versus a five-year-old versus an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old. It changes as you get older. It kind of hopefully gets a little more stable as they hit late 20s, 30s, but your relationship with them will change. So um, the fact that you're learning about some of these things is spectacular so you can change along with them. Now, um, this conversation intelligence, as we're calling it, or, or as it's termed, is important because I've crossed paths with many parents who are really lost with how to connect with their kids, or they can feel their kids pulling away and they're like, what do I do to keep them you know, talking to me so that they're not claiming up, so they don't go out in the world and aren't getting support from me. And um, so I know a lot of parents say, I've tried. I ask about their day after school. I do a board game night. I, you know, I try this, I try that. I'm not getting anything. So the thing is that all of those things are great and wonderful, but if the trust isn't there, then the conversations are not gonna flow. And when I'm saying trust, as you can tell from the things we've talked about so far, it doesn't mean I'm telling the truth. It's more than that. The trust is about the whole relationship about this art, right? If we think about it, it's about all of those pieces of it. They need to know that they can trust you as the parent and trust that relationship, right? Um, so, so trust is just really important. So I really want to make sure that, you know, if, if you only leave with one thing from tonight, it's that trust is the key to getting the communication open and to maintaining the conversation. And if you need some ideas on how to create the trust, um, contact me and we will we will talk about this okay so this is what I want you to think about you are going to make sure that you aren't coming across as the lion which kicks in the fight or flight right you want to come across as the soft little cute little adorable kitten which one well this picture of the lion is pretty tame but you know, which one would you want to encounter if you're sitting out in the park you really want to encounter a kitty who's nice and safe and gives you that calm, right? Not a ferocious lion that might eat you. So we need to understand that our kids are actually wired to see us as this lion. They are biologically wired to have that fear, the fight or flight kick in when they hear you call their name. And that's so that they will be pushed to individuate from us as parents and to get on with their life, so to speak. Because if they were attached to us like they were when they were two, they're never going to go out on their own and, you know, go and get a job and go to school and go have their own lives. They would be attached to us forever. 
And while some of that sounds interesting and like, wow, I would love for my kids to be here, um, we know that for their sake, they need to move on and they need to detach from what's right. Okay. So I don't have time tonight to go through everything, but I'm gonna tell you what trust stands for. That's T-R-U-S-T. -T. So transparency, we have to be consistent. Um, relationship, we have to make sure relationship is first and foremost an, an importance. Understanding where they're coming from, um, sharing and successes and testing assumptions. So I've got a little bit of time left. So I'm gonna go through the first two, transparency and relationship, which will give you a little bit more of an idea of how to create this trust, okay? So transparency, this word obviously means being able to see through something, right, in its simplest terms. And by being transparent with your teen, it means that you'll be quelling the reptilian part of the brain, right, that fight or flight. If you don't create transparency, then there's uncertainty, and the uncertainty is what creates this kind of shutdown of the um, let me bond with you. If it's uncertain, they're not going to be in that mode. Okay. And specifically, there's a lot of different ways that we can bring transparency into the conversations, but really this comes down to the whole thing we're talking about of being consistent, being that same parent over and over when they come to you. And one of the things that also parents will say, I try so hard to create conversations. I tell my kids, you can talk to me about anything, but that phrase, you can talk to me about anything, is very vague. So what you have to do is you have to get a little more specific. What does that mean? So you can tell your kids when you're having this heart to heart, like I really wanna be here to support you. I want you to be able to come to me. And what that means is I'm gonna listen to you. I'm not gonna judge you, honey. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has different things they're doing in life. I'm not gonna blow it out of proportion and I'm going to love and support you. So you can see how different this is than just saying to your child, you can talk to me about everything. When I ask teens about this, well, your parents tell you, you can come to them about anything. They're like, yeah, but I don't really trust what that means. I don't really know what they're saying. If I come to them and I tell them something, am I gonna get in trouble? So, and by the way, there could still be consequences even with loving conversations. But this is where the trust is built. When they come to you and then you follow through with these four things that you've told them to expect from you, when they come and share. Okay, each time that you fail to follow through with those four things, the, um, the weight of trust and distrust, it kind of, the scales are tipped to the distrust. So that doesn't mean that you can't get it back, but you have to go and talk about this, not just slip it under the rug. You need to say, you know what? When you came to me, I yelled at you. That was not our agreement and I apologize. I'm going to do better. And so you have to reset. Now, if you're thinking about the arc, you know, it might have been here and then it goes way back down. It's going to take some time to go back up, but it's worth it to keep building that trust back again. Okay, then we've got the R in the trust, and that stands for relationship. And this is one that in our teens' lives, tweens' lives, younger too, if you're super busy and you're always on the go, then a lot of times what is put first is not the relationship, but the to-do list, right? We have to remember that we want to have a relationship with our kids that's not just transactional. Remember, transactional was way on the left side of that arc. Transactional is, I need you to do your homework, do your homework. I need you to do the dishes, do your dishes. So that every time you and your teen have a conversation, it's about the to-do list, right? But your job is to create this relationship, which remember is constantly changing because your child is different than they were five years ago, than they were five months ago, five days ago, in some cases, even five minutes ago, right? You have to make sure that you're connecting constantly and rediscovering who they are in that moment, in that day, and accept who they are, right? Devin, connect before you correct. Love that. Okay, and here we go. In the busy lives of teens and parents, you gotta, you gotta put this to-do list second, not first. I know you have to get this stuff done. Your teens have to get this stuff done. The relationship comes first, the um, to-do comes second. And that doesn't mean that you drop the to-do list. It means that you take the five, 10 seconds, 
maybe five minutes to connect, talk to your kids on a level above the to-do list, and then you can jump into all the to-dos. So imagine if you put your relationship with your teen before the perpetual to-do list. Like, how would that feel? It would be very different, right? Okay, I see in here, let's see. Um, I'm too strongly engaging in a transactional way. Got it, yes. And this isn't, you're not alone. This happens to many parents because you've got that to-do list. You're like, I got this, I got this. We're gonna get this done. So you forget about that connection piece. So the fact that you have mentioned that means you're gonna be aware of this and you're gonna make some changes, I know. Okay. Now here's another thing to consider that your teen will feel more respected you're going to have better rapport with them and you're and they're going to feel that you care when you do this connection before all of the transactional stuff right when the relationship comes first and of course you know that you always care but to a teen if you're constantly talking about the to-do list and not about them they feel like you don't care and as a parent it's frustrating because you're like i do care that's why i'm staying on top of these things that's why i'm asking about your grades that's why i'm you know doing all of these things but to a teen it's like but do you care about me or do you just care about the grades or do you just care about me achieving in gymnastics or do you just care about you know me volunteering or do you care about me as a person and so that's what this r is like this r needs to be big a big r because relationship is so, so important. And when you put the relationship first, the other stuff starts to fall in line. There's more respect there. So when you're asking them to do things, when you're engaging with them and they feel like you see them, you hear them, you respect them, then they're gonna want to have more conversations with you, right? I mean, think about like if you're at a job and the only thing your boss comes and does is tells you what you're doing wrong, or that a deadline is coming up, you're like, okay, I get it that's totally transactional. And most people want something a little bit more than that, right? So here's something I want you to really consider. 10 years from now, okay, those of you with littles, maybe it's 15 years from now, think about what is going to make the biggest impact in your life and in your team's life. Is it going to be that the trash was taken out on Saturday exactly when you asked it to? Or is it that you have a strong connection with your team? I mean, yes, the trash needs to be taken out. But I think we all can agree that, that connection should take priority because your relationship with your kids is going to be a lifetime. The to-do list is just for now. Okay, any questions? I think there was one. Um, let me see here. Let me look at some of the comments. Um, my daughter says, I try too hard to connect. So that one, all right, that may be that um, it may look like you are doing the asking so much, like, um, how was your day? How's everything, honey? Like, you know, in your face kind of, and you can connect in different ways. It doesn't always have to be verbal. It doesn't have to be questions. Um, if you think about how we connect with people, it's that we say, I know you or I see you. So if your daughter's like, let's say watching TikTok, you can sit down next to her and say, hey, what are you watching? or you can just sit next to her, not say anything. Even that is a point of connection because you're saying, I'm gonna be near you, okay? Okay, let's see. I treat it as a given that I care about them, but probably they need to feel and see that differently. Yes, yes, um, that's a very good point. We know we care, but we have to be verbal and let them know that we care. And the things that we think of is like, I'm making you lunch, so of course I care. I'm taking you to dance, so of course I care. They don't see it like that. So we have to be point blank. I love you and I care about you. And even if you're doing things for them, I'm driving you to your soccer practice because I care about you. To say that instead of, oh, I got to drive you again. Oh, I'm so tired of driving. Things like that, right? Okay. Um, when one parent is controlling and one passive, how do you get to a higher level of trust? All right, here's the thing. Your relationship, your individual relationship with your team is a different relationship than your spouse or your partner's relationship with your team. So you cannot control what their relationship is like. You can only control what your relationship is like. 
So what you need to concentrate on is, are you building the trust between you and your teen? And their relationship is a different one. Because when you try to try and say, oh, but we need to do this for both of us. Yes, that would be wonderful and great. If your teen has just one of you over in the share and discover, that's going to be great for them. So it doesn't have to be both of you. It can just be yours and just work on yours. Um, let's see, how would a relationship type of conversation go? So um, let me give you an example. Um, let's say that you know your kid has a big homework assignment. Maybe it's a group assignment or some big presentation, right? You walk in the door, they're sitting on the couch and they're just watching TikTok. So here's how the, the conversation goes. You come in and say, hey, how are you doing? What are you laughing at? Is it a funny vi dog video? You know, something, whatever they're watching. Um, can I see it? You watch it maybe if they'll share it with you and you laugh and all of that. And then how are you today? Was it a good day? And then you might say, um, don't you have that like big presentation tomorrow? Oh, that's great. How's it going? So you see that's different then. Why are you on your phone? I know you have the presentation. Stop watching TikToks. Go do your thing. You know, it's just you are caring about them and what they have going on. Um, I hope that that answers your question there. If not, um, just Harmony, you can tell me if you want more follow up on that. Okay, let's see. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, I think that's all the questions I see. If anybody has other questions, let me know. I think we are, let's see, oh, we have some time left. I was looking at the wrong timer here. Yay, okay, we've got time. Um, I often hear, I will do that later, and then he continues to play, yes. Okay, so this is the time, I know everybody, like, give me a, an emoji or something. If you have issues with getting chores or getting homework done, projects done, just so Harmony doesn't feel like she's on her own, okay? Let me know if you've got that going on in your, your household, too. So here's the thing with them saying, I'll do it later, um, with chores, homework, whatever it is. If they say, I'm going to do it later, then that's when you step in and you have your parameters set. Again, in a relationship type of way, you're connecting with them, you're helping them. You can say something like, okay, like how much time do you need? So you're giving them some responsibility and some choice. And that might catch them off guard because they're not expecting that, but they might say, um, I need 15 minutes to finish what I'm doing. Say, okay, um, set a timer on your phone. Or you can say, I'm going to set a timer. Or you can say, okay, I'm going to trust that in 15 minutes, you're going to have this done. You're going to get up and start doing whatever it is. If not, then I think it's fair that there's a consequence. So what do you think that consequence should be? They can offer something and you can offer something. And then you walk away. And in those 15 minutes, you're probably going to have to take some deep breaths. You're going to have probably going in your mind. You're going to have, he's not going to do it. He's not going to do it. I know this isn't going to work. And that's okay. But those thoughts are in the other room. You're not telling your child that. 15 minutes comes and goes. If they've done it, thank you so much. That's wonderful. I knew I could count on you. So you're developing the trust back and forth, right? And if they didn't say, I'm a little disappointed because I thought I could trust that you were going to get that done. Okay, so now you've got to do it right now. And whatever that consequence was, you set in place. So with all you notice neutral, you're not coming back angry. You're not saying, I knew you couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't trust you. You're saying, hmm, yeah, I really thought you were gonna follow through. And so as you begin to do this more and more, your teen is going to begin to feel more of a responsibility versus that, oh, mom's gonna tell me 10 times. And after the 10th time, that's when mom's gonna lose the her cool and yell, and then I'll do it. Even if they don't realize they're waiting for that pattern, I'm gonna wait until I get in trouble and then I'll do it. Okay. Let's see, can someone know, maybe Val or Anurada, if you've been watching, if, is there any questions that I missed here? Okay, here's one. Um, huh. My kids have your phones most of the time while home, so hard to have any conversation at all. I'm sure people can relate. What is a good way to open dialogue and set boundaries without being controlling? Um, good way to open dialogue and set boundaries. So that's an interesting question, the way that it's worded there, that it's either have an open dialogue and set boundaries and being controlling or not. Um, 
so to have the open dialogue and set boundaries is kind of like what I was just saying, like give as much control as you can over to them, constantly saying, I'm gonna trust that you're gonna do this, but you can also set the boundaries. So let's say, um, let's say with video games, okay, this is a, a common one, and your teen wants to play like eight hours of video games a day. Well, as a parent, it's okay to set a boundary that say, I know that you love video games. I love that you're so good at them. And I think eight hours is just a little too much because it's taking away from your, your time to do other things, including like interacting with family. So let's talk about um, what the boundaries can be that seem a little bit um, more realistic. So you see how that's starting it without judgment or anything. You're just saying, yeah, I know you love it. That's great, wonderful. And there's this other thing you need to consider so let's have a collaboration and talk about it. If you're looking at the slide here, the I to we, right? We wanna make sure that we are going to the we in collaborating even when you're setting these boundaries. Okay, I'm gonna show you this slide really quick and then I'm gonna turn off slide sharing. I forgot I had that on. Then I'll go back to, um, I think there's a couple more questions here. So if you wanna stay connected with me and find out more about the, the UST that we didn't go through, um, you can jump into my Facebook group, and from time to time, I put the the um, overall trust in there. So you can just jump in there and um, look for other things. I have lots of lives in there, lots of videos on communication, and there's a lot of stuff in there on girls' friendships and drama, but there's, there's stuff on communication too. And we will make sure that we get this out later, a uh, connection to that. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And let me look at the rest of the questions. My son is very much into Roblox now and wants to give up playing piano, refuses to practice. Um, can't finish the assignments that piano teacher gave and I don't know how to handle the situation. Um, this is about having an open conversation, collaborative conversation, saying, you know, I've noticed these things that I wonder if you're not liking piano anymore, what's going on there. Um, you know, and just have that open conversation. It is possible that um, your son just does not want to play piano anymore. And if that's the case, find out what they want to do instead. Now, the answer might be Roblox, right? But that's when you can come in and set the boundaries. If, if he says, I don't want to play piano, I just want to do Roblox, you can say, okay, you don't have to continue with piano, but Roblox can't take the place of piano. It's a completely different thing. So what is another activity you would like to do? Or maybe another instrument that you would like to try? So you can say, okay, love, Roblox is fine, but you still need to have something else in your life. Okay, um, so I've got that one. All right. If you think of another question, you can throw that in here. I'll still be watching. Okay, so I do want to mention that we have, this is the last parent chat for this um, session. And we will be back in January. So I hope that you all will join us there. And Val, they don't have to re-register, right? Can you pop on and just tell us a little bit about that? Yes, you are correct, Sherry. Okay, you will awesome. not need to re-register. Um, and in fact, um, you are already registered. Sorry about that, Sherry. I'm in the midst of cooking my dinner as Sorry. I listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do want to share really quick, <laughs> and, and Sherry, you can comment on this. I'll put the list of topics up really quick. Excellent. Um, yeah, so there, the first one in January is one that we, we've really thought about what we need to include in this lineup. And so the first one we're going to do is on self-harm, because even if right now your kid is not experiencing it, the chances of their friends experiencing it are really, really high. It's something that is happening a lot now. Um, it's become unfortunately a coping skill that is uh, a lot of kids are turning to. So we're gonna have that. We're gonna have grit and gratitude, which is a fantastic one as well. Um, we're gonna have body confidence, how to talk to your teen about image and eating habits, which is this is so important, so important, because we can accidentally um, say the wrong things and we don't even realize it. And then we've got asking about suicide, what caregivers need to know. I mean, amazing lineup, but we still have more to come. If you have topics that you want us to talk about, if you can pop those in the um, chat box, because we have a couple of slots still that we need to um, 
to put in there. So uh, that we need to fill. So we'd love to hear from you on that. Okay. All right. So let me leave you with one last thing here before we take off and um, going about the day. Let me see. Well, let me ask, um, losing weight concerned about that. Why? Um, I, if you can clarify what you mean by that, maybe I can answer that. Depression and anxiety in teens. Um, Mariana, can you um, expand on that? Like, what is it that you want to know about that? Because we want to get as specific as we can on these things. Um, also, um, honesty. So do you mean like lying and things like that? Um, LGBTQIA, what exactly do you want to know about that? Um, you know, tell me that and we can find somebody for sure on that about supporting, about just gender and um, about sexuality, um, how to support a teen. Okay. Small eyes. Okay. All right. So we'll go back and we will look at these. So I uh, thank you so much for, for telling us these. And you can always email us too and let us know too. All right. Parent chat at lwsf.org, which um, I put in the um, chat. Also, okay. a link to the winter quarter uh, list of topics. Excellent. That's great. Okay. And before everybody pops off, um, if you can put in the chat box something that stood out for you tonight, something that was like an aha, yeah, I can use that, or that really hit home for me, um, I would appreciate that. For me, it's very helpful to know what works, what doesn't, what, what resonates with you so that I can change things up. I'm always learning um, as a presenter as well. Okay, so um, here's what I want you to remember as you leave. Conversations are at the heart of your relationship with your kids, okay? The time you invest to strengthen your conversations is going to directly impact your kids' self-esteem, their confidence, their joy, their mental health, because you are at the heart of who they are becoming. Thank you everyone so much. You got this and I hope we'll see you in January. Good night.